Greetings, greetings, greetings. That was a phenomenal panel, lessons from diverse founders, you know, Buzz Solutions, Pano, Kitty Credit, all really bringing their authentic selves and their previous experiences to effect change where it's needed most, whether it's drone data to fix power lines or A and I, AI and IoT sensors to prevent wildfires or credit education and support. Um, you know, speaking for myself and the Good Light team, we, we're definitely excited to be on the journey with you guys as investors. And I know the, the broader community is here for it and looking forward uh, to participating and accelerating your growth in as far as we can. Uh, what I can basically promise is that it's only gonna keep going and getting better and better. I have uh, two amazing uh, individuals here who have been through every phase of the founder journey, if you will. The, the next session is you know, founding to exit. And I have Michael Leffenfeld and Cheryl Conte who are gonna be able to share uh, some of their experiences and expertise and we'll walk through uh, a lot of that, share some nuggets and, you know, in as far as there are questions from the audience, feel free to throw them in the, in the chat and we'll do our best to incorporate those into the session as well. How are you guys, uh, Michael and Cheryl? Great. Great to be here. Excellent. It's good to see you. So let's jump in maybe with a, a little introduction from each of you so that folks at home have a better sense for why I'm excited. Not that I wouldn't be excited anyway, but some of the reasons I'm excited to be here with you. We'll start with you, Cheryl, and then move over to Michael. Sure. Well, I'm the CEO of the Impact Seat Foundation. Uh, the Impact Seat Foundation's mission is to create a world in which women, especially women of color, can succeed as business leaders. We do that through uh, a combination of uh, full stack Philanthropy is what we call it. So it's grant making, impact investing, and advocacy. I'm also the founder of Do Big Things, which is a leading progressive digital agency working with candidates, causes, and corporations around the country. Uh, I'm also the author of the Amazon bestseller, uh, Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success. I wrote that book uh, after acquire, uh, selling my company, Attentively. Attentively is the first tech startup with a black female founder on board to be acquired by a NASDAQ traded company. Thank you, Cheryl. Out to you, uh, Michael. So not as, not as prolific as, as Cheryl, but um, I'm a uh, physical science entrepreneur. I, um, I'm a technologist by training. I have degrees in engineering, physics, and chemistry, and then immediately got into the entrepreneurial venturing of medical devices. Um, then after that, got into a group, built and grew a chemical business that exited back in 2016, 17, and currently running a turnaround business for a private equity fund um, in the mining chemical space. So um, I've advised numerous venture capital, invested companies, um, private equity companies, venture capitalists, and private equity funds. So. Um, have sort of the full gamut of, uh, of the founding startup to the exit um, at different processes and different levels. So looking forward to, uh, to working through this with you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Michael. And I think both of you have worn so many hats and seen so many cycles of the business process. We, always, we often hear people talking about startups, but the objective is to move from startup to growth and then hopefully create liquidity or, or some scenario where you're not as beholden to every whim. And you know, each of you have, has done that in some form or fashion. And so let's start with Michael. If you go back to kind of the early days of Cigna, how did you know that you were onto something and that you really had product market fit? So, um, so Cigna is a, is a chemical company that took basically, for any of you that took a chemistry class all the way back to grade school, you may remember your teacher throwing a piece of sodium metal in water and getting a big fireball. And um, we figured out how to get that fireball out of the chemical and keep all the reactivity to do general chemistry from, you know, oil and gas recovery to petrochemical refining, specialty chemical, pharmaceutical manufacturing and alternative energy and everything along those lines. Um, we knew we had something when you sort of you know, when you discover a type of chemical that can be used in a safe 
and, and more green way, uh, more sustainable way um, with less risk, without with less hazard. Um, but the problem was is that the chemical does a lot of things. How do you choose which market to go to first? How do you get that first customer? And um, you know, what we did was we took all the benefits of the new chemical and sort of figured out what its independent, what its individual uses could be and what its individual, you know, benefits could be to the market and sort of looked at, you know, where those markets stood, whether, you know, whether pharmaceuticals has a long sales cycle, um, oil and gas, obviously huge volumes that you need to get into, alternative energy, nascent, no commercial market at, at the time. This was back in 2007. Um, and, you know, so we had to then, you know, really think through how to get that first mover advantage at the, you know, at the volumes we could supply at the prices we needed, because obviously tons of overhead at the early stage of any founding company. So, um, so there was a lot of that, you know, business analysis for market analysis, looking at the total addressable markets and seeing how we can obviously penetrate those into, into gaining some of that market share for ourselves. Um, and ultimately, you know, feeding into those markets. And then once having that base, that base load to cover our costs, you know, increasing volumes, increasing profits, increasing, you know, distributions and, and all the things that come along with it. So that's sort of how we started off. Exciting. Um, before moving on to, to Cheryl, and even with you, Mike, kind of what happened next, just to drill down a little bit more, who were some of the first initial users and how long did it take you to secure those? Yeah, so, you know, we actually were lucky enough that we got some early press, both in some scientific trade magazines, um, as well as, you know, in some, some more, let's call it grandiose, um, you know, press and magazines, which existed back then. Uh, <laughs> not so much now. But, um, you know, so we actually had pull from the market. Our first customer, our first, our first batch ever made was sent, was sent to one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, um, which was a big risk. Um, I'm not a big proponent of starting with the biggest player in the space first, because you're going you're gonna to step on your toes and trip over yourself um, a lot. Um, you know, when when getting those first products out there and how to use it and how to how to how to benefit from it, so um, but we were lucky enough to start there and from there we grew. We did start playing in some niche markets um, in the chemical space, smaller players, you know, higher value drivers, and then you know, and then we then we worked our way up to the big oil and gas companies, to the big chemical players, to the big you know battery and and power players out there. So we 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 we. <laughs> We, we looked at number two, number three, number four first, and then, then started to approach the number ones out there. Wonderful. Thanks, Michael. And for, for those in the audience who don't know you as well as I do, they may think you're, you're, humble, you're humble bragging, but I know you're not the type to do any kind of press. You like being under the radar. So the no. fact that that happened, you got that press, is definitely luck, but we're happy that it worked out. <laughs> It, it's it's hard to, it's hard with a last name like Leffenfeld to hide, but I, I do my best. Excellent. Uh, so Cheryl, uh, similar question, right? In the early days of attentively, how did you know you were onto something, and you know how did you kind of identify product market fit, and what was that like for you? Sure. Well, we had been my business partner and I had been running the digital agency. It was then called Vision Strategy. Of course, now do big things for some time. And we noticed since we straddled a few different worlds, the tech world, the business world, you know, the nonprofit world, that nonprofits had really fallen behind um, in terms of their use of uh, social media listening and influencer engagement. At the same time, we saw some of our peers in the nonprofit sector, which, by the way, is an $800 billion a year uh, in terms of uh, goods and services consumed. It's a, it's a pretty big sector. Um, you know, we could see folks in our space building software that solved problems um, and opened opportunities for causes. So we put two and two together and just started to bootstrap uh, a, a tool that we thought would help our clients be more competitive, you know, in terms of getting ideas into the space and understanding, you know, who their most powerful supporters really were. 
So we uh, created the software with excess time with our developers. We alpha tested it with clients that we already had. And then it came to a point where we could see, uh, you know, if, if this is really going to take off and be a thing, it's got to spin out of the agency. It needs its own CEO. You know, it needs its own investment, its own PLs. Uh, so we started the fundraising process after that. Got it. Okay. Um, and let's dig into that a little bit more. What was the fundraising process like? Uh, yeah. Yeah. What were the, uh, the the highs and lows of that? Uh, so many lows, actually. You know, at the time when I started fundraising, you know, we were running, you know, a business that had, you know, it was multi-million dollars in revenue. You know, both my business partner and I had been on, you know, mainstream media, you know, both print and TV. Um, you know, we were, we were pretty well known in the space. And so, you know, to have people not return my phone calls, you know, not, you know, respond to my emails, uh, you know, was really, you know, it was very humbling. And uh, you probably saw folks see in the link the Astia Edge uh, report that recently came out. Uh, Astia is one of the largest uh, funds that, uh, angel funds that works with female founders uh, of startups. And uh, they worked really hard to weed out all of the, as much bias in their pipeline as they could. But what they found where they got stuck was getting the angels to write checks. Uh, it takes, they found, you know, in their study, among other things, that it, it took uh, around seven introductions to funders on average to get a white female tech founder funded. It took on average 40, four zero, to get an equivalent black female founder funded. And that, you know, when they told me that, I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. You know, it's, at some point I intuitively figured out it was a numbers game, just, you know, to Ibrahim's point, you know, Ibrahim said it, you know, there are people with bias, biases and I don't want to work with those people. So it was, you know, haters to the left. I'll just keep working and grinding until I find the people that get it. And I did, but, you know, America, just to be clear, is asking black women to do like, literally 10 times the work to get less money for perfectly good equivalent tech. Got it. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And I can only imagine that it's super challenging. And obviously that's part of the reason that we've created Good Light. And we actually see it as a tremendous opportunity because uh, what the data also shows, however, is that once uh, women and you know, Black and Latino and various underrepresented groups get capital, they actually return more and they return quicker. And so, you know, we're hoping to uh, really lean into that and capitalize on it uh, through collaborating with folks like yourself. Uh, Michael, are you there? I'm here. Uh, okay, for a second, I felt like the screen was frozen. Um, Stay very still. <laughs> I got you. Uh, meeting your, your inner Zen. I like it. Uh, would you mind sharing? a couple of the biggest challenges that you had when you were in the early phases of scaling the company? Sure. You know, I'll, just to build on the theme of fundraising, um, you know, physical science companies are, are not an easy thing, at least in chemicals, it's not an easy thing to raise money for. Um, it requires a really long sales cycle. It requires a lot of steel in the ground and capital that you have to, you know, that you can't get money back from, you know, unless you sell pennies on the dollar. So chemical investments, you know, are a, are, are definitely not the, are, are the, not on the high part of the list of, of companies that they're being, that VCs and, and investors are being pitched to. Um, luckily for us, you know, I, I had some successful ventures prior to, to Cigna and, and I was able to, you know, fund the company myself and, you know, through some prior, you know, people that have made money on prior ventures. Um, but, you know, at some point, you know, that was a real, you know, we were not welcomed into many, into many pitch sessions um, through it, no matter how, you know, no matter how blue chip our, our, our customer roster was. Um, after that, the challenges are, you know, you're, you're commercializing a completely new technology that's never been seen before, never used before, you know, and getting that customer use, you know, typically if you've, if you've ever been in, in this, you know, in the science world and, in, you know, in chemicals and things like that, 
you find that a lot of people believe that if it's not invented here, it's not important. Um, the not invented here, you know, you know, belief is a is a strong one in 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 the physical science technology world. So really getting people to champion the technology because there's more risk in making a mistake than there is reward in being successful with a new process. Um, you have to overcome a lot of those barriers and finding those champions and proving, you know, the use case and how it can be done, you know, in a smart, safe way that puts little risk because, you know, obviously if you're changing out a, a chemical process, you gotta, you know, most of the chemicals that get made or, or you know, you know, at the time fossil fuels are going to produce, um, you're talking about millions of tons of product a year that if you make a mistake, that's a significant, you know, obviously hurt to the business in, in revenue, but also you got to think about all the supply chain disruptions. Just think about, you know, right now, the, you know, infant baby formula that's, that's short on shelves. Could you imagine you couldn't get a, you know, a toothbrush or a, Tire for your car because those chemicals are, you know, didn't work in a major manufacturing process. So having that proof of longevity and that proof of, you know, the ability to, you know, substitute into that process without having a risk to the, you know, the downstream um, was truly a, a, you know, a complication that, you know, we didn't think would be so hard to overcome um, when, when once showing that the technology worked, but there was a lot of, a lot of gut checks along the way to make sure that you can get through all of that, uh, all of that, you know, analysis. It sounds kind of like the, the type of situation where youth and relative naivete work to your advantage because you don't know how bad it's going to be. And so you're willing to, to go for it. Um, can you speak a bit to the human element, right? So you talked about the chemicals and getting stuff on the shelves and everything else, but at the end of the day, you're building a business, you have tens, then dozens, then hundreds of people, and you're running the whole thing. Were there ever any issues with respect to managing the humans? You know, look, you know, there was, at the time when I was doing this, I was, I was a lot younger than I was now. And, um, you know, it, you were always the the you know the the young you know the young genius or something like that. Somebody would say when you when you come into a room, which was always a hard thing to press. And did you know obviously the rest of the team didn't get the the look that you would hope they would get because obviously I always tell my my teams being the CEO is the easiest job in the world. You come up with all the ideas, but you don't have to execute anything, especially when you have a team below you, right? When you're starting out, you have to do everything and everything falls on your shoulders until you have other employees. But to me, you know, if you have, you want to be the dumbest person on your side of the table every day of the week, because if you surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, you have to work a whole lot less hard. Um, but yeah, obviously, you know, the, the human building a business I've always found, and mind you, I'm in a turnaround now, I'm running a business for a private equity fund that's a, that's a turnaround. Building the culture to me was always a, an easier thing to do. You, you, can, you get to choose the DNA of your business um, from every hire that you make, because you know, obviously when you're starting from the, you know, from the you know, from hire number, you know, number one, you get to choose the passion level, you get to choose the, you know, the, the thoughtfulness, the secondary thinking capabilities, all of that, all of that type of, you know, intelligence and, and, you know, and effort that goes into a team, you get to build from the, from the, from, from day one. Um, that to me is always the, the most fun of building an organization, holding the ladder for those that you come through so that they can ascend into your eventual role, because, you know, eventually you don't want to be sitting there for too long. Um, you know, and, and that, that ability to build that bench and, and hold the ladder for those to climb and to get promoted and to get to ascend to higher ranks that they ever thought they would, you know, to me is really the most, the most impactful part of, you know, of, of building a business more so than the, the commercialization and the exits and all that type of stuff. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, Cheryl. So as you said earlier, um, attentively being sold uh, to a 
NASDAQ publicly traded company. That was the first time ever for a black woman. And um, what happens after that, right? It's, it's kind of, you're used to being scrappy, having to make calls and people are not answering and it's humbling. But then once you sell a company, I'm sure not only are people answering calls, but you're the one screening calls. So what's the, how, how is that shift kind of going from scrappy startup founder to being on the other side of that? It has been interesting, and thanks for asking, Jacques Philippe, to to join the the VC world and uh, better understand, you know, how uh, angels and and venture capitalists make the decisions that they make. Uh, you know, I think I've been surprised at how subjective uh, the process is for many uh, investors, uh, and certainly one of the things you know I'm eager to do is to you know add more rationality. You know, as you said, Jacques Philippe you know, BIPOC-led businesses and women-led businesses are actually really good investments. You know, all of the studies show that diverse teams are more innovative, they are more profitable, and they're more productive. So then the question is, why aren't you? Like if you're, you know, what happened in 2020 is that more venture capital than ever before entered the system and invested in companies, but investments in women and BIPOC people were actually cut in half. That's sure. not rational. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense at all. And it's not the future of our economy. So uh, that's what I'm really about. And, and it's been exciting to be in conversations like this, you know, with the people who, you know, have the vision um, of the future and can help to build it together. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm right there uh, with you and looking forward to building in that regard. Um, and maybe for each of you, you know, we have quite a few founders who presented today. We have even more in the audience and they're at different stages in their evolution, if you will. But what are a couple points of advice that you would share with them? Maybe Michael, you first and then Cheryl. You know, from, you know, obviously looking at it from Looking at it now, um, being able to look back at it, obviously in a different place than when you're starting out and, and building a, you know, building a company for the first time. But who you work with, to me, is is more important than any other variable out there. Obviously, getting that funding is important, but who you get that funding from, I think, is more important. That you align on values, that you align on vision, that you align on on work cadence and ethic. Um, all of those things you don't really analyze in the moment, or at least I didn't, um, starting out. For me, it was always worthwhile to, you know, to really figure out that you have the people that you can, you know, that can, that can check you, right? You, you, you need, you know, as a, as a passionate founder, you know, sometimes you need to be you know, you need to be checked a little bit and make sure you get put back onto, you know, you know, a little bit back on your heels at times. Um, but to me, that that pairing is more important than the name, right? Having, you know, Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia or, you know, or, you know, those those brand names that everybody seeks and values don't necessarily come with as much to me as the value alignment that is more important to a founder, especially when starting out. That, 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 that family that you're generating for, I'm not trying to be flippant with that term, but you, you become, you know, I, I used to say that, you know, my, my girlfriend at the time, wife now, um, you know, was, was my mistress, right? My business was my, was my, was my spouse, right? Because you're spending 24 seven, you know, when those tidal waves come and, you know, and, and things aren't going the way you want it to, that having that ability to really share in, in, you know, in your humankind more so than just the business was most important to me. Totally a hundred percent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Cheryl, what are uh, some nuggets that you'd like to share with founders out there? Sure. Five quick hot things. First, uh, believe in yourself. 
Okay. No one's going to believe in you and invest in you if you don't believe 110% that you and your team and your concept are going to win. So always bring that energy to the table. Uh, number two, 90% of American small businesses fail in their first year, uh, and something like 90% of those fail by their third year. So there's a really good chance, founders, that for reasons that have nothing to do with how ambitious you are, how driven, how smart, how creative, how hardworking, that your business, for lots of environmental reasons, isn't going to make it. That's okay. You can fail up. Okay, fail up just like the white guys. Okay, we've all seen it happen. Like you can do it, uh, you know, because look, any savvy uh, executive is going to see you as someone who dared to dream, you know, who has ambition, you know, who worked really hard. And you have a set of executive skills now that is going to help you become an executive, you know, a, a leading executive, a valued executive in any kind of enterprise. And then three books I can recommend to you that are going to really help. Uh, Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success, my Amazon bestselling book. Uh, check it out. You know, it actually goes through a whole life cycle. Uh, a lot of people don't realize there's a life cycle to most startups. It goes through the whole life cycle and, you know, has uh, not only my story, but a lot of stories from diverse founders and investors uh, and, and tips on what to do and how to do it. Uh, our founder at the Impact Seat Foundation uh, just published Build Your Board, Build Your Business, The Path to Million Dollar Success Explained. You want million dollar success? Check out her book. Uh, on Amazon. It also is an Amazon bestseller. And then finally, Catherine Finney, uh, founder of uh, the Genius Guild, uh, which is an amazing organization. The Impact Seat Foundation uh, actually is a lead investor. Uh, Genius Guild invests in startups led by diverse founders that scale to the diverse community and beyond. She just published Build the Damn Thing, it's a great title, right? Build the damn thing. How to start a successful business if you're not a rich white guy. You can do it. All right. I like it. You know, I know we could go on for quite some time, but from what I can tell, we're a little bit over. I appreciate you guys carving out the time to uh, speak with me, to speak with the Good Light community. Today we covered so much. You shared so freely, and we appreciate you for that and look forward to. Uh, being in touch and continuing to build with both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, take, take care guys. Well, and so with that, um, it essentially ends our uh, day two of Inside VC. Uh, we were able to cover so much. Hopefully you agree with me that uh, today was at least as good, if not better than, than yesterday. We start off with uh, Terry Wu from Bank of America talking about their billion plus commitment <clears throat> we had to uh, diversity and inclusion and investing in, in sound GPs. We then had Bahia Robinson from Include VC really talking about the intangibles uh, with respect to impact and purpose and clarity and compassion and education and building the ecosystem. We then went to Peter Adrians who dropped knowledge on us um that could have definitely gone on for multiple days so we'll have to circle back but you know especially with respect to esg and the intricacies there and how that links uh to investment then brenna saint Ange, the executive director of the alliance center uh really went into the topic of regeneration um i think many of us didn't realize uh you know we look at sustainability or being green but that's really just the initial phases of where we need to be, but regeneration as far as recreating, reproducing and creating systems that work for us all and the fact that it's all interconnected. Uh, Dave Kim and Will uh, with NFT Oasis, they really brought the emotions and the feelings and the literal music to the movement. They're about staying human and presenting the metaverse as an extension of what we've done in the physical world to the virtual world and really allowing so many more people to participate. And Dave Kim with his paralysis was a, a tangible example of that, which really hit us in our hearts and spirits. Uh, we then moved to 
you know, amazing founders. We have the diverse founders from Buzz, Pondo, and Kitty Credit, all of which are companies that we've invested in, as well as NFT Oasis, and they're all, you know, bringing their authentic selves to really impact change and, and do things um, in category-defining manners uh, that can yield, you know, substantial returns to our bottom lines, but as well as for the evolution of our species. And then last but not least, we had Michael Leffenfeld and Cheryl Conte talk about founding a business all the way to exit and everything in between and dropping nuggets that uh, we can all really benefit from. So um, tomorrow will be our final day of Inside VC. It's gonna be exciting. We're gonna dig in a bit more to structuring deals and all the intricacies there. Uh, hopefully you know, each of the last couple of days have built on themselves in a way that we can all follow. If you have questions, make sure you're sending them in. We're gonna continue to do our best to get you those answers. Tomorrow we'll be digging in a bit more the top side uh, of the day as far as structuring deals and, and how they work and the intricacies there. And then we're gonna have the opportunity to, to apply uh, much of what we've learned over the last couple of days in a live evaluation of Breaker, which is an amazing company in the creative economy. They have something like 60,000 uh, influencers and creatives on their platform and they're uh, creating more opportunity for artists to be able to monetize that which they create. You'll be able to hear direct from the founder, uh, Anthony Brown, tomorrow, and we'll be in conversation and you'll be able to ask questions. And then you'll be able to go in to our system and provide your input. Speaking of which, make sure that if you haven't already that you uh, go into the email that you received from Good Light Capital, which allows you to sign up to our evaluation platform. And that's gonna allow you to be prepped because tomorrow, once we're done with the conversation with the founder, you're then gonna take five, six minutes to respond to a few key questions and you'll be able to see feedback that's provided to everyone else. And it'll give you a sense for how the actual evaluation takes place, how you're able to participate and affect the outcome. And if you can't tell, it excites me and I'm hoping that it excites you as well. Um, and last but not least, you know, at Good Light Capital, we're about people. It's about our team. It's about the community. It's about the world around us. It's about, you know, the sectors that we care about, sustainability, health and wellness, education, future of employment, fintech. And, and when it comes to community, it's about all of us. It's about you in particular and the people that you care about. And so I highly encourage you to reach out, right? Send, you know, go to our website at goodlight.capital, go to the community page, and make sure you share that with other founders, with people who are looking to make investments, with folks who are curious about the sector, who should be involved in supporting underrepresented founders, because it's, it's through that sharing and getting more people involved that we're gonna be able to really uh, accelerate the rate of change that's necessary in 2022 and beyond. And so with that, I thank you. And I look forward to uh, seeing you tomorrow. Take good care.